Hi, my name is Ko and I'm with the Institute of Electronics at Graz University of Technology. Today, I want to talk about superheterodyne spectrum analyzers. A spectrum analyzer is a device which can analyze signals in their frequency domain. While an oscilloscope is used for time domain analysis, a spectrum analyzer is plotting the frequency on its x-axis. After watching this video, you are familiar with the basic principle of a superheterodyne spectrum analyzer and how to work with this device in a simple measurement setup. Because I will discuss the main differences to an EMI receiver as well, please check out our video about EMI receivers first. A spectrum analyzer is used to analyze signals in respect of their composition of frequencies. As an example, in this slide, two signals are summed up. If one sees only the sum of both signals with an oscilloscope, it is literally impossible to see the composition of all frequencies. However, by analyzing the same signal within the frequency domain with a spectrum analyzer, the composition becomes clear. But how does a spectrum analyzer work? The block diagram of a superheterodyne spectrum analyzer may look complicated at first. To understand the basic principle, I have highlighted the most important blocks here in green. The input signal will be mixed with a known locally generated frequency. This frequency changes with time and is responsible for each point on the x-axis. At the same time, the mixed output will be filtered by a fixed bandpass filter. The desired information for the y-axis can be found within the envelope of the filtered signal. The bandwidth of that filter is called resolution bandwidth, abbreviated as RBW. Let us assume that the EMI receiver input port is connected to a signal generator. All the power of the signal that is located within the filter bandwidth gets integrated and will be represented as one point on the EMI receiver's display. Now, the locally generated frequency changes with time. We can imagine that we are sweeping our input signal through the fixed bandpass filter. When the sinusoidal input signal is inside the resolution bandwidth, more power gets integrated and therefore a higher value can be seen on the display. The peak is measured when the filter bandwidth is exactly in the middle of our input frequency. After that, less power is within the filter bandwidth and therefore the value decreases. After the sweep has finished, we can see the shape of our filter on the display. Therefore, the narrower we set the resolution bandwidth, the higher is the resolution in frequency. If we now think back to our example at the beginning, we hopefully see both peaks on the display of the spectrum analyzer. However, if the resolution bandwidth is set too high, we may detect only a single peak and we cannot distinguish both frequencies anymore. So, the wider resolution bandwidth brought us two things. First, the noise floor gets higher because more total power is located within the wider bandwidth. And second, we cannot resolve both frequencies anymore. Therefore, we want to set the resolution bandwidth as narrow as possible as that would give us the most detailed frequency resolution. The trade-off, however, is sweep time. As we have seen, the basic principle, the superheterodyne principle, applies to both devices, spectrum analyzer and EMI receiver. Now, I want to highlight the most important differences between both devices, here in green. First of all, the field of application differs. While the EMI receiver is fully CISPR 16-1-1 compliant to measure fully unknown signals, the spectrum analyzer is mostly used when some information of the signal is known. Therefore, the block diagram of both devices differ a little bit. The first component which the input signal passes is the attenuator. 
This block is often set automatically to prevent the analyzer from taking damage because of too high input levels. In addition, overloads of the analyzers are prevented. You must consider that not just amplifiers can go into compression. Frequency mixers, which also contain active components, can also produce overtones. The attenuator is followed by a low pass filter. This filter blocks very high frequency signals from reaching the mixer. Otherwise, unwanted responses could occur. Some spectrum analyzers are using preselectors instead of a simple low pass filter. Same as in EMI receivers, the preselector is a switchable filter bank where an appropriate filter is chosen automatically. In general, spectrum analyzers do not contain a preamplifier before the frequency mixer. Because the frequency mixer reduces the signal strength, an amplifier is used to prevent the loss of resolution in the y-axis. One very important component is the resolution bandpass filter within the intermediate frequency, abbreviated by IF, as explained some slides before. A logarithmic amplifier is used to convert the signal from a linear scale to a logarithmic scale, as the y-axis of a spectrum analyzer is usually plotted in dBm. dBm should remember that the input signal is divided by 1 mW before calculating the logarithm to get rid of the unit. But basically, you can also set your spectrum analyzer to show the results in dB microvolt as this unit is common in the topic of EMC. As the information can be found within the envelope of the intermediate signal, we need to load the capacitor with the rectified signal. In contrast to EMI receivers, a spectrum analyzer generally does not offer complex detector settings, but has an additional video bandwidth setting instead, abbreviated by VBW. This sets a low pass filter for the display signal. So one can make the display signal smoother. Lastly, one very important difference between spectrum analyzers and EMI receivers is the way how the frequency sweep of the local oscillator is done. Whereas the EMI receiver is sweeping stepwise, for example every third of the resolution bandwidth, the spectrum analyzer is sweeping continuously. This can be seen in this animation. The filter shape of the resolution bandwidth literally sweeps continuously through all frequencies. Please remember that in reality not the filter is tunable, but the signal frequency is swept by the local oscillator when using superheterodyne devices. The stepwise sweep of an EMI receiver can be seen in this animation. Here. The filter shape jumps every half of the resolution bandwidth. Typically, after a single scan, one needs to restart manually to start a new measurement. Okay, we are now here in the lab and I want to show you how to work with a spectrum analyzer. So with this device here. But before that, let me explain you the devices which we are using today. So first, here, we have an arbitrary waveform generator. I have written a waveform file in MATLAB and we will feed the waveform generator with that file and we have to analyze that file. So let's, the aim is to find out with which frequency components the signal is made of. And to do this, we will observe that signal first in the time domain so that we will know how the signal looks like and afterwards we will analyze the same signal here with the spectrum analyzer. Okay, so to start, let's apply the arbitrary signal and now on the scope, we can see here this signal looks, looks strange. So it looks like a combination of the sine and the triangle of function, or it looks like a tooth so function or something else, but the edges here are smooth, so actually we just don't know how the signal is built. And we know here 
thanks to the scope that the timing scaling is one division is equal to 100 nanoseconds. Therefore, we know that two divisions here are 200 nanoseconds, which is equal to our period time. And therefore, we know the base frequency of our signal. So we just cal calculate one divided by 200 nanovolts, and we will obtain five megahertz. So when working and analyzing the same signal with the spectrum analyzer, we know the base frequency, which is at five megahertz. So let's look for it. So just stop the output, plug the cable off from the scope and plug it in here on our analyzer. And let's zoom a little bit in. Okay, before we start to look for our signal, let's preset our device first so the default values are loaded. And then switch to the spectrum analyzer mode again because this device here can work as both network analyzer and spectrum analyzer. So let's choose the spectrum analyzer. And great, let's activate the output. For orientation, on the x-axis, you can see the frequency. CF is the abbreviation for center frequency, which means that here, the middle line here, refers to three gigahertz. The span is set with six gigahertz, which means here on the right, we have six gigahertz, and here on the left, we have a very low frequency, which is about nine kilohertz, so the lowest possible value which we can measure with this device here. On the y-axis, we see the power referred in dBm. So it's a logarithmic scale here. And now we know our base frequency, which is at five megahertz. So let's type in here with the center frequency of five megahertz. And we, have this sig we found the signal here now. And with, there's an alternative way to display that signal here, we can also define the x-axis with a start and a stop value. So we can also say let's start with three megahertz and let's stop at six megahertz or at seven megahertz. And we have now our signal here again. But we can see the signal here is cut off a little bit. This is because the top line here has this reference level at minus 20 dBm. So let's, let's set the reference level appropriately, so adapt it a little bit. So let's, that's the top level is now zero dBm, which means that here zero dBm is equal to one milliwatt, which means that our signal here contains less power than one milliwatt. Okay, now we want to find all frequency components which the signal is made of. And beforehand, we have seen here on the right some kind of peak before. So we can just use a bigger span. So we can set the span to, let's say, 50 megahertz. And now we can see here that in addition to our base frequency here at five megahertz, there is also another signal component here. And now for a better display, let's set the frequency in another way. So let's say that the start frequency should be at three megahertz and the stop frequency should be at mm, 12 megahertz. And now we have displayed both signal components here in a nice way. And now this is the solution. Our signal, which I've created here with MATLAB, contains two signal components. First, here it's base frequency at, let's use the marker, at five megahertz. And another frequency component here at, let's look for it, 10 megahertz. So the double of the frequency here, so it's like an overtone of the first frequency component. And 
we can see here that the second peak here contains way less power. So please remember of the logarithmic scale here. So the first marker here says that our signal contains about minus 3.5 dBm, and the second one minus 18 dBm. So it's way less power, although it does not look like that's so much less power here. But the logarithmic scale makes it a big difference here. And now I want to show you some important um, options here. The most important one is the resolution bandwidth. So we can, so basically it's set automatically. So resolution bandwidth is set automatically, but we can also set it manually. And we will see if we'll narrow the resolution bandwidth. So if we decrease here, the number here, then the resolution and frequency becomes finer. So the peak becomes, um, can be seen here better. But the trade-off can be seen here. So the sweep time here is, um, it does take way longer time for a whole sweep here. And you can also see here, if you take a look here on the noise floor, now it's decreased. And if we are now widen the resolution bandwidth again, the noise flow also increases because more power is then located within the filter bandwidth. Another setting is here, the video bandwidth. So most of the times it's sufficient to set the video bandwidth automatically, but you can also um, choose this manually. And this video bandwidth is some kind of a low pass filter of the display signal here. So if we narrow that filter bandwidth, we can see that here on the noise floor, that this becomes more flattened. So the display signal here, it's like a voltage which must go through a capacitor here. But the trade-off here is once again sweep time. And this can be seen here on the top. So here we can see the three main parameters First, the resolution bandwidth, which is set with 30 kilohertz now, the video bandwidth, and the lower we will choose those two values, the higher the sweep time gets. So now a full sweep takes 5.6 seconds, and if I will set the video bandwidth now automatically, then the sweep time just takes 10 milliseconds. So one full sweep from here to here just takes 10 milliseconds. So, that's it. I hope you've liked the short introduction on how to work with a spectrum analyzer and that you have learned something new. But anyways, thanks for watching.